Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Welcome all of you to this live program at Orthopedic Principles. Today, our guest of honor is Dr. Neil Shade from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Neil is the Chief of Orthopedic Surgery at the Pennsylvania Hospital, and he's also Associate Professor of Orthopedic Surgery at the Hospital for the University of Pennsylvania. He's affiliate faculty at the Penn Center for Africana Studies and also senior fellow at the Leon Davis Institute of Health Economics. Neil obtained his undergraduate degree in biomedical engineering with a minor in finance at the University of Pennsylvania. He then spent two years on Wall Street as financial analyst in Solomon Smith Barney's healthcare investment banking prior division prior to attending medical school at the Albany Medical School Medical College. Following medical school, he completed a six-year orthopedic surgery residency at the hospital for the University of Pennsylvania. And subsequently, he completed an adult hip and knee reconstruction fellowship at the Rush University, as well as a three-month mini fellowship at the Endo Clinic in Hamburg, Germany, focusing on periprosthetic joint infection. Dr. Shade returned in 2012 to the United States to join the faculty at the University of Pennsylvania and focuses research on bone loss pertaining to revision arthroplasty, periprosthetic joint infection, and the role of orthopedic surgery in global health. So today, it's my great honor to bring back Dr. Neil Shade for this wonderful live program. Over to you, Neil. Thank you so much, Hitesh, and uh, Happy New Year to everybody who's on this uh, webinar. And Hitesh, thank you again for the opportunity to come speak. And we had a great uh, discussion, I think, the last time uh, back at the end of September. So uh, I'm going to talk today about minimizing your learning curve with the direct anterior uh, total hip replacement. And I'm going to talk to you about my experience converting from the posterior approach to the anterior approach. I know specifically in India, as well as around the world, there is a lot of interest in the anterior approach. And we have seen it in the United States with almost more than 50% of hip surgeons doing the anterior approach now. My disclosures are as follows. None of these are really pertinent. I am a consultant as well as an educator for Medacta. But the most important disclosure is that I am a traditionally posterior trained surgeon. So during my residency, during my fellowship, I never did any anterior based approach at all. Uh, and so this was completely foreign to me. So one of the big questions I get is, you know, why were you interested in the direct anterior uh, total hip replacement approach? And I will tell you, number one, the most important thing for me was as a hip surgeon, I should be circumferentially comfortable getting into the hip from the front, from the side or from the back. Number two, there's a lot of literature that is coming out regarding the anterior approach. And I think it's very hard to critically evaluate the literature if you've never done the approach. And most importantly, I would say is that residents and fellows here in the United States are requesting exposure to anterior approach total hip replacement. And as the site director for our fellowship at Pennsylvania Hospital, I think it's important for me to be able to provide the educational items that our residents and fellows are asking for. I will tell you this had zero to do with marketing. I am not interested in marketing a specific procedure or an approach. And I will tell you in the last 10 years in practice almost, I think there's very few patients I can even think of on one hand that have asked for a specific approach. Um, but uh, marketing was not part of my rationale for switching over to the anterior approach. But of course you can imagine, even at that point, if I had done a, a couple of thousand uh, posterior approaches, whether it's primary hips or revision hips, this Relay, this created a significant amount of panic and anxiety for me because I had no desire to actually change my procedure and potentially cause harm to patients and create complications that I was not seeing. I was never unhappy with my posterior approaches and I do a mini posterior approach for most patients. Uh, but this again is a way for me to be circumferentially comfortable getting into the hip any way that I want. So I think when you're switching from posterior to anterior, I think it requires a very dedicated approach to actually making the switch. And this step, the steps that we took, took us about a good three months almost to make sure we did it right. So here are the five different steps and I will go through each of these elements. So number one is looking at the anatomy and literature uh, review. So I was comfortable with all the anatomy around the hip. However, I'm just not used to seeing it from this perspective. Seeing it from the front was very, very different than seeing it from a posterior curve. So I spent some time really looking at the anatomy and re-familiarizing myself with looking at the hip from the front. Most importantly, though, 
is understanding the capsule. I think the capsule was one of the toughest things to understand because they have never really seen the capsule from the other side of the hip. So now all of a sudden the ischiofemoral capsule is not the important one, but now you've got iliofemoral and pubofemoral ligaments and capsule that are coming from the front that again, I have never really seen during a total hip replacement. Frederick Lode, who's in Paris, who is truly a master surgeon when it comes to the anterior approach, he was one of Le Tournel's last uh, residents, uh, I think in the late 1970s or early 1980s. And he wrote this really very elegant paper about the anterior approach, which goes over all the anatomy uh, around the anterior hip. But specifically, he had really nice diagrams and descriptions of exactly what the uh, ligaments and capsule were, where they attach, where they originate from, where their insertions, and what the function is of each segment or subsegment of, of the capsule. Um, and so this was really helpful for me to start really thinking about this and being cerebral about the anterior approach. Following that, he also has this diagram which shows all of the ligaments and small short external rope centers where they attach. And again, the orientation is just different. I'm used to seeing it from the other side of the hip. And so I had to basically switch my brain 90 degrees from what I was used to seeing. Step two was observing a mentor. So Tyler Goldberg is, a, uh, is an orthopedic surgeon in, uh, in uh, Austin, Texas, at Texas Orthopedics. Um, he's a, an adult hip, uh, hip and knee reconstruction surgeon. He trained with Frederick Lode for some time. And he is actually in charge of the educational platform for Medacta. But I was able to go watch him and watch him do three anterior hips. And to be honest, for me, it was like being in sensory overload because I've never seen one again. Uh, prior to going to see him, he does have a nice video online, which you can find on YouTube or on the Medacta website, which goes over the anterior minimally invasive hip surgery approach. And it is a very clear and clean video that actually goes over all the steps appropriately in sequence. And I must have watched that video several times before I went to go watch him. After I watched him, what I did was actually create a very detailed annotated procedure document on how to perform an anterior hip. And this is just sort of my technique and my preparation for learning a new procedure. And so as a result, after going through that, that's the way that I was able to really kind of dissect out the different components of this procedure <clears throat> so that we can actually get through this without having a major complication um, increase in our patients after total hip replacement surgery. So after that, I had the opportunity to go and watch Frederick Lode. And like I said, Frederick Lode is up here on the left, uh, top left of your screen. On the right hand side, he's actually there with Joel Mata. So Joel Mata was actually the last fellow with Le Tournel. And at the same time, Frederick Lode was a chief resident. And as you know, that Joel Mata came to the United States and popularized the anterior hip. And Frederick Lode has been doing anterior hips for the last almost 40 years now uh, in France. And if you go to Paris, almost every hip surgeon does the anterior approach. And when you talk to Frederick Lode, he says that you just have to be better than the next guy. Interesting thing is that Frederick Lode does the approach by himself with a, a, a table attachment to the uh, regular OR table. And he has this little pneumatic arm called Gaston, which actually assists him. He does not have any, any other assistant other than his scrub tech, who you can see behind him. Following uh, that observership, I went to a cadaver lab. And what I did was I asked to go to a cadaver lab where Tyler Goldberg, my mentor, was going to be at the cadaver lab teaching. And so then I asked the head of education for Redactor to say, when he does a demonstration, would you mind if I assist him on the demonstration? And then if he can assist me on the contralateral total hip. And that was fine. They set that up for me. And of course, I chose the most obese or most muscular cadaver, which would be the hardest. Uh, and again, that would give me two more iterations of watching an anterior hip before doing this live on a patient. So again, this whole process took two to three months of time and preparation before going live and doing this on an actual patient. So the hard parts for me were, again, doing the exposure and getting comfortable with what I was seeing and in the position that I'm going to be seeing it. Next was getting the acetabular. Yes, everyone says the acetabular exposure is excellent. I agree. It is, but the orientation is off. Yeah, right? 90 degrees off from what I'm used to seeing. Acetabular positioning now, all of a sudden, raising your hand is, a, uh, is anaversion as opposed to potentially having more uh, being abduction in the, in the posterior approach. 
and vice versa. So again, changing position of components was a little bit different than what I had normally been used to. Putting in screws was different. Now all of a sudden I've got to put the screws into the same quadrant as the uh, posterior approach. But again, that quadrant is now rotated 90 degrees from my normal orientation. Understanding these ligaments and these attachments was really critical. And again, I think learning a systematic approach on what to release when in order to get your exposure of the femur. So I was taught to release the pubofemoral ligament first. That allows a little bit more rotation. Next, I came up to the ischiofemoral capsule and taking down a little bit of that supralateral capsule. That allowed a little bit more rotation and a little bit more mobility of the femur. And then typically third, I will take down the in, uh, operator internus and I have no problem taking this down completely. And in really tough, tight hips, I'll take down the piriformis. But the last one is the operator externus, which you can see on the medial aspect of that cow car. That uh, short external rotation you do not want to take down. I think that confers more instability to your hip uh, as that will retract back significantly. So now we got to the point of performing our first case. The nice thing is that we had uh, Tyler Goldberg actually come and scrub in my first two cases to observe my first two cases. So he scrubbed in, stood right next to me, did not touch the patient, but was able to make comments to say your incision's in the wrong spot. It's a little bit too medial. It's not oblique enough. It's a little bit too distal. Your retractor's in the wrong plot spot. Change this, change that, rotate the leg one more click. All of these things, but that decreased my anxiety as I basically had him next to me watching. And it was a day that I had less cases on on purpose. So I had a good hour to hour and a half to be able to basically do these procedures. Uh, after those first two cases, our team performed the next three cases. And after that, after the first three cases, I went back to one more cadaver lab. This time I took my physician assistant with me and we spent some time really looking through and trying to figure out some things that we weren't doing right. More importantly, I had my physician assistant actually go spend time with other surgeons and at other tables to see if there's any tips or tricks that we can learn uh, that we can incorporate into our technique. After our first 30 cases, we went back down to, uh, to, uh, to Texas to go watch Tyler Goldberg. And at this time I uh, was able to bring my PA, my physician assistant with me. And he stood where he normally stands. And he recognized that you know what, Tyler is able to do something that his view from his perspective, from my uh, physician assistant's perspective, was different than what we see back home. We need to figure out what we need to do differently. The nice thing is that the two of us saw three more cases, and then we spent the flight home from Texas back to Philadelphia, and we wrote two additional pages of notes between the two of us on what we learned that day uh, in our 30-page already annotated document that we created. After 60 cases, Tyler Goldberg came back up to Philadelphia to watch me. And at that point, we had really gotten our, our, our procedure down pretty, uh, uh, to this point, pretty routine. And at that point, he signed off on me becoming an instructor to teach the anterior approach for, uh, for surgeons who wanted to learn how to do it. I think one of the critical components of everything that I've told you so far is having a team that is engaged in learning. You have to have a team-based approach. Having my physician assistant attend that second cadaver lab session with me was critical. Putting together that annotated procedure book uh, was really important. And reviewing that book the night before every single anterior hip, at least for the first 20 or 30 cases, was really helpful. Getting your scrub tech, your circulating nurse, anesthesia, your radiology tech, everybody together to say we're learning a new procedure together was absolutely important. In addition, the night before surgery, our entire team would review the video. For 30 minutes, we would watch the video together again. Uh, and again, we did this for the first 20 cases, I would say, uh, to see if we figured out or learned any additional little technique that we didn't do well in the last case. And then after every case, uh, for the first 20 to 30 cases, my physician assistant, myself, the resident or the fellow would sit down and we would debrief debrief each case to see what we did well, what we didn't do well, what do we need to change for the next anterior hip that we did. This process, although it sounds cumbersome, was critical, I think, in dropping our times uh, for what 
uh, we recognized we were able to actually accomplish in a short period of time with the anterior approach. We then went forward and created our own video, which I've given to the residents and the fellows. And again, it's the same very detailed systematic approach that Tyler Goldberg demonstrates in his video. And as a result, this is available on, uh, I think this might be on YouTube, but it's also on our PEM portal for the residents. So we then looked at some data to look at our learning curve. So we looked at the first five cases that we did, the average length of time for the surgery from start of the incision to start of closure was 87 minutes and our blood loss was a little bit more than 300 DCs. Again, remember after five cases, we went back to the cadaver lab. We learned a few more tips and tricks and figured out what we were doing. So for the next 20 cases, again, we dropped our average time uh, almost by 35 uh, minutes or so, um, down to 51 minutes. Our average EBL for those next 20 cases was 224 CCs. At that point is when we had, had went back and went to go see Tyler. Uh, and try to figure out some additional things to incorporate into our technique. Well, look at the next 130 cases about, we dropped it down to average time of about 42 minutes. Average blood loss is about 128 cc's. I'll tell you we're at the point now, I think yesterday we just did close to our 400th anterior hip in the last four years. And, and we can, I can do this kind of procedure now. now on a normal patient, normal complexity. Uh, with a resident and we can be done in less than 35 minutes with the resident doing probably at least two thirds of the procedure, uh, including the exposure and the acetabulum. If I look at those first 130 cases or so, 150 cases, we had one greater trochanter fracture, which was my uh, technical error. I could not get the femoral head out. And as I was trying to make my neck osteotomy with the saw, the corner of the saw blade actually hit the greater trochanter. So when we extended the greater trochanter fracture, uh, we had one infection, uh, which uh, required an IND poly exchange, and we had one periprosthetic fracture, which was a type C fracture that occurred five weeks post-op, uh, and the patient had literally just come to see me, got an x-ray doing great, and then slipped and fell in the alley, uh, as she was walking uh, out of the hospital and had a periprosthetic fracture distal to the stem. Uh, we had no episodes of instability in those first 130 cases when we were looking through our learning curve. And this is what the benefit I was seeing. This is one of our primary care doctors. He's 78 years old. He's 10 days out from surgery. And you can see how he's walking at 78. He, has, he had his right hip done. He needed his left hip done at that point, which we did a couple of months later. He was able to go back to work 11 days after surgery with very minimal pain, very minimal requirements with regards to any type of assistive device. And for a gentleman who's 78 years old, that is nice to be able to rehab that quickly after a major operation. So starting out, what were the green light indications early in the learning curve? So I looked at four different components, which is deformity, soft tissue, bone stock, and BMI. So I wanted patients with minimal deformity, no sclerosis in the canal, which you can see with the AVN. I wanted a nice long valgus neck and maybe a narrow iliac flare, uh, meaning the iliac wind being a little bit narrower, giving you more space to work on the femur. Soft tissue, mild to moderate muscularity, and minim minimal to moderate level of osteophytes. Uh, did not want patients who had severe osteoporosis, which increases your risk of potential periprosthetic fracture. Um, and as a result, more normal bone stock patients were the patients we selected early. And then BMI, obviously patients who are thinner and not too obese. I think the contraindications early in your learning curve is you do not want patients that have large deformities, severe dysplasia, sclerotic canals with AVN, short varus necks and wide iliac flares make it much more difficult to get the exposure you need to work on the femur. Soft tissue wise, very muscular patients make it much more difficult Severe osteophytes, again, make it a lot tighter and tougher to get the exposure and get your neck osteotomy performed and getting the femoral head out. Obviously, previous radiation can potentially change the skin uh, in the front of the hip. Bone stock wise, again, severe osteoporosis. If you're doing this for a conversion THA that required hardware removal, you're not going to want to do an anterior approach. Any type of procedure where you're worried about posterior column bone loss, um, and again, revision total hip replacements, not cases you wanna do early on. And obviously obese patients with a BMI greater than 40, you wanna be clear, stay clear of early on in your learning curve. So we actually did some uh, 
research and looked specifically at our cases and published this article earlier this year in 2020 on how do you go about safely implementing the direct anterior approach and what is a methodological approach that you can use to minimize your learning curve. So what we did was a retrospective review of prospective data. And I looked at two patient cohorts, looked at my first consecutive 100 direct anterior total hips compared to my last 100 consecutive mini posterior total hips. And at that point, I'd already been seven years into practice. Uh, and mini posterior was my standard approach for most hip patients uh, that were of normal body habits and normal deformities and that, that such. And again, we looked at the learning curve uh, for those first 100 anterior hips compared to the standard approach. And what we were looking to do was not to say that one approach is better than the other, but is to evaluate the training methodology that we used. So the outcome variables that we looked at is we looked at demographic data, operative time, hospital length of stay, estimated blood loss, and most importantly to me was overall complication rate. And what we noticed is that the patients for the most part were the same in both groups, uh, except they were a little bit older in the mini DA group, uh, in the, uh, in the uh, direct anterior group. But the important thing for us was that the complication rate was really no different for any type of complication following surgery, whether it was intraoperative or perioperative. In addition, when we looked at the surgical time, we were about seven minutes longer on average for our anterior hips, which is significant based on the number of cases we looked at. But I don't think clinically uh, significant. And length of stay was almost 0.7, almost a full day less for the anterior approach compared to the posterior approach. Um, and again, the, this is looking at a multivariate regression analysis of all of our data. The important thing again was that our complication rate was no different between the two procedures. If I look at my current practice trend, you can see over the last four years, I've gotten to a point where we're now almost 70% anterior on most of our hips. And every year just continues to grow a little bit. So 2016, we did about 35. 2017, 87, um, 2018, 75, and about 100 in 2019. And again, you can see in 2020, we're at a little about 127 patients. So we're probably heading more, more towards doing more anteriors as my indications have expanded and we're taking on more complex patients that need the surgery. Continued learning is an incredibly important part of this, um, of what you need to do when you're learning a new procedure. And what I mean by that is, that initial book that we've put together, we're now on version 14. And I'll tell you that we're actually in the midst of putting together version 15 of our book of additional things that we have learned. Okay, so that's over the last two years, any additional things that we have put together and learned uh, from the technique and things that we want to change in the technique we put together in that book and continually re-annotate and revise and revisit what we're doing and what we need to change. I will tell you what's interesting is Tyler Goldberg, after seven years and after 2,000 anterior hits, went back to France to go watch uh, Frederick Lowe. And that was back in February of 2018. That was two, two years ago. It was three years ago now. And what's interesting is that he took seven pages of notes of what he wanted to change in his practice uh, based off of what he watched with Frederick Lowe. And so again, this is a guy who's extremely experienced, who has a lot of, uh, has an incredible ability to actually teach this to other surgeons, still has a plan for continued education, continued learning, going back to his mentor to see what he's gonna pick up now, um, to basically see what he can change in his own practice for his own patients. I think when you're thinking about minimizing the learning curve for any procedure, you have to spend time on this, especially for the hip side. If you're transitioning from posterior to anterior, you have to, you have to spend time. I don't, especially if you're not going to take time to go spend three months or six months to go do a formal fellowship on training on a procedure. I don't think what is adequate is, um, is what most people do, which is watch an experienced surgeon. They perform a few surgeries, they watch them, and then they go do one cadaver session, and then they go live and take care of patients. And that's where I think you see a much higher complication rate. In my mind, it's as if you trained on doing shoulder surgery from the beach chair position, 
and then you all of a sudden try to do the same approach through a lateral decubitus position, it's the same thing. You have switched your orientation by 90 degrees. Uh, and it's not uncommon when I see residents on our shoulder service, there's some surgeons in our department that do it for the beach chair position and others that do it lateral decubitus. You can see the patients turn their head when they're doing their arthroscopy because the orientation is disorienting for them and it's 90 degrees off from what they're normally used to seeing. So I, I equate our posterior to anterior conversion as to be very similar from beach chair to lateral decubitus for the shoulder. In summary, I think you have to design a disciplined approach. You have to respect the time that's required for preparation. I think creating an annotated document is really helpful to help get your thoughts on paper and think about how this should uh, follow and, and sort of get the sequence down right. Having a team that is dedicated and engaged to learning an approach is really important and always have a plan for continued education. At the end of the day, I think my last comment is a new procedure truly is not a spectator sport. You have to get in the game to do it right. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Neil. Uh, fantastic presentation. And I really appreciate and admire, I mean, the discipline, like what you say that that's been taught since childhood. Like even after being the chief of orthopedic surgery, you went, you spent, uh, you made all the discipline to go down to Texas and learn this new procedure. I mean, that's very important, especially for fellows and residents as well who are listening to this talk. Yeah. No, I think Hitesh, that, that's, there's no question that this has zero to do with my surgical skill or anything. This has nothing more to do with than preparation, right? I was unwilling to introduce a high complication rate to my patients. I was not unhappy with my posterior approach. I'll tell you when Tyler came to watch me and help me for my first two hips, in the other room, I had a posterior approach. And he said, do you mind if I come and watch? I said, sure, come on over. And I did a hip replacement through a small incision and it was only 30 minutes. And I had a nice team with me at that time also in the second room. And when I was testing the stability, I was able to get the hip to 90 degrees of flexion, 90 degrees of internal rotation. It was not dislocating. And he said, yeah that was not the posterior approach that I was performing seven years ago, right? I took down a lot more tissue and I was getting to maybe 40 degrees and it was starting to dislocate. And that's why I was a little nervous. And that's why I switched to the anterior approach. So it was not that I was unhappy with it, but I was unwilling to compromise what our patients were going to experience based on, Hey, let me just try this new approach. And Hey, I've done plenty of hips already. This is another hip replacement. This shouldn't be so hard for me. If I look at most of the people that have come to some of the training programs now in the last few years that are posterior based surgeons, they abandon the procedure in the first few months because they have complications that they don't want to have. But I think it has nothing to do with their surgical skill. It has to do with a lack of preparation. So I think you're right, Hitesh. That's the biggest thing. And for fellows and residents, right? I mean, they look at that and say, when do we ever see an attending learning another procedure, right? They're always teaching us when do they ever demonstrate that they're learning anything? And the fact that even the residents in the beginning, I felt badly because I'd say, I can't have you do much of this procedure because I'm not sure how to do it yet myself. So even the residents and fellows four years ago were saying this was actually very important for us to watch, even if we're not doing part of the surgery, just to see the process of what you're going through and how you're thinking about this, which I think is really important. Okay, thank you, Neil, for that. Uh, and what is the incidence of uh, femoral nerve injury? Have you encountered any, any femoral nerve neuropraxia? Great question. So, you know, I think that the some of the data out there shows that it's anywhere between 5% and 70%, depending on who's doing the procedure. But I think it's also dependent upon where you place your incision. I think the original anterior approach was through a Smith-Peterson interval, which is a further medial incision. And there, I think you're going to be somewhere 50, 70%. You're going to have some nerve injury or some persistent numbness. Uh, now that we do this sort of modified hoiter approach where you're coming over the TFL, so more of a lateral-based incision, working inside the fascial sleeve of the TFL, I'd say it's less than 5%. I ask everyone at two weeks. And the 5% that I've had, probably by six or eight weeks when they come back for their second visit, they say it's better. And for the most part, it resolves. But every now and then you're going to get someone who has some aberrant anatomy, some weird branches that come across that you can't prevent from either retracting or uh, 
even cutting through it as you're getting into the fascia. But it's it's very low uh, from the uh, from this more lateral approach. Thank you, Neil, for that. And what you mentioned about the initial uh, 100 cases. So what were the incidents yeah. of component malposition? Or, I mean, were you able to place it rightly? Or were there higher incidents of dislocation in the first 100 cases? So we had no dislocations uh, in the first cases. And I will tell you out of 400 cases, I've only had one dislocation um, so far. And uh, let me knock on wood, just as I said that. But uh, so um, I think component position is actually easier to do because I can see it under x-ray. So I know that I have medialized appropriately. I'm in the right abduction. The hard part is version. The tendency on an anterior approach is to put too much antiversion in. And as a result, you're at increased risk for anterior instability then, right? So then most people will overcompensate and put a lot less antiversion in. And then people will come into the office complaining of iliopsoas impingement and tendonitis because now the cup is uncovered anteriorly and anterior superiorly. So um, what I've learned in the first 100 to say 300 cases is that I'm putting in some smaller cups now. So if the femoral head measures 48, I'm not putting in a cup bigger than maybe 50 or 52. I don't need to go to the six millimeters bigger because I think there's a chance that you're going to have some cup uncovered. Number two is the anaversion. What I check for is I make sure when the cup is seated that it is flush with that antro superior lip of the acetabulum so that it's not uncovered there. Um, and now I've become a little bit more cerebral about looking at what is happening with the lumbar spine in the seated and standing position to see the change, to see, does this patient need more antiversion, less antiversion? Do they need a dual mobility? Is there something else that we need to think about for this specific patient that changes compared to a normal patient? So I, I don't think component position was hard to do, especially on the acetabulum because you're looking right at the socket and I have x-ray as a secondary uh, measure. Uh, so do you have the EOS software? Because a lot of centers right now have the EOS software, which looks at the spinal pelvic alignment. Do you have it in your hospital? We, we do, but what I actually use more importantly is I get a standing and seated lumbar spine x-ray. So I don't even need EOS. I could care less rest about the risk. I just look at how much the anterior pelvic plane is switching from the standing position or from the seated position to standing. And then I look at what is the sacral slope and not so much the value, but is the position of the sacral slope and is that changing or not? A normal spine should change when they go from standing to, from sitting to standing. And when it doesn't change, tells me that that step spine is stiff and that they're at increased risk for instability when they're sitting down and they try to stand up from a seating position. So I think without EOS, you can still do it. And Neil, what is your experience with uh, revisions? Have you started doing revisions with the direct anterior? I remember having read the paper I've, I've by Lee Rubin, Lee Rubin from Yale. By who? Uh, I mean, uh, Lee Rubin from Yale, Yale University, Connecticut. I think he does, he has yeah. started doing revisions uh, using the direct anterior. So I have, I have only done a handful of revisions from the front. Uh, I did my first formal revision just about maybe four months ago, which was an isolated cup exchange from the front. And again, I did a lot of preparation and talked to Tyler and talked to guys like Christoph Corton and Belgium and got a lot of their expertise because this past year I was supposed to go travel through Europe for a week to spend some time with a bunch of different guys doing anterior hip revisions. And I, I again, I think it's, it's going to be even a bigger, um, uh, a bigger transition for me to do a revisions from the front. And I need to, again, prepare appropriately in order to do it safely for patients. That revision went very nicely. Um, the other couples that I've done have done, that have done fine as well. Uh, I have not gotten to the point of revising femurs and stuff from the front. And, you know, I, I am not also sure, to be honest, if you confer as much benefit when you're doing some of these big revisions from the front, because now you're taking down TFL and doing osteotomies around the pelvis and You've opened up all this stuff. Like, I mean, is it really that much better than my posterior approach, which is one incision and 
and then you're down. I mean, there's not much else to do. Um, so I'm not sure. I, I think maybe for select revisions, it might be helpful. Um, for some, I don't think it's going to be helpful. So we'll see. I still have a lot more to learn. Uh, thank you, Neil. I think that's all the questions that we have. Fantastic talk. I mean, it's very important. I, I mean, I would recommend this talk to all the residents and fellows on how a chief of orthopedic surgery spend so much of time learning a new procedure. Thank you very much for joining in. Thank you, Atesh. Have a great day, guys, or a great evening, wherever you guys are. And uh, be safe, and I will talk to you soon, all right?